know who I am. But you don't know why I'm here. Hello to Razor Ramon. guys like Greg Gagne, 
you know, of course, Kurt, Greg Gagne, Brad Rangins, you know, the road warriors, you know, then, you know, Nick Bockwinkle, Vern Gagne. Then, you know, when I got to the WWF, then, you know, then they put me right away. They put me, Kurt was already there. They put me with Kurt, with Flair, with Bobby Heenan. So I always had a lot of guys in my ear helping me out. And, you know, it uh, just went on and on. And then as I started to know a little bit more, I I learned that from those guys, particularly Kurt, that you got to grab the young guys coming in the door. You see somebody with some potential, and you want to smarten them up right away. Don't let them waste their time doing the wrong things. Smarten them up right away. I love watching young guys wrestle. I have a son now, Cody Hall. He's 21, and he's you know he's had a handful of matches now. He's really promising. And in fact, he's going to be coming up here to join me in Atlanta soon to hang out with Jake and Dally and myself and. We're going to get him booked to some little local shows around here and then look for some international work. And I don't know how much you've got to see of WWE in the past couple of years, but there's guys there like Jack Swagger or Dolph Ziggler who, you know, they get the big push when they come in and they maybe get a run with the world title that lasts a month and then they're right back down the card. Do you think that's something that would hurt them long term or do you think that... Is that something you worry about with Cody is if he went to WWE then maybe they'd push him straight away because of his connection to you and then he'd go straight back down the car and he'd have to work his way back up? Well, I I can't really comment on what's going on there because I haven't really been staying in touch with the wrestling scene. You know, I mean, I've been following a lot of this small-time stuff only because Cody was involved in it. You know, I would go to the wrestling school with him there in Florida and watch his work and then... You know, he would go to town, so I went the first couple of times, but then I started feeling like he almost needs to do this thing on his own. You know, he doesn't need me hanging around. I want, you know, what he did was he'd go wrestle, and then we'd come back and we would study the film. You know, we would talk about it then, or, or you know, we would we would talk about the match before, and then he'd leave the house, he'd go have the match, he'd come back, and he'd show me, the, you know, the film of it. And then we would review that because... I didn't want to be like the overbearing, you know, dad, all, you know, so I wanted him to go out and do his own thing, you know, so, but going up and down the card like that, yeah, I don't, I mean, I've had people come and you know, I've, I've only been using this, this iPad for about two weeks now, so I don't know a whole lot about this whole internet world out there, but I do think it's cool that so many people have reached out to me and, you know, and I get to hear people's opinions about stuff. And a lot of, you know, obviously people want to talk about wrestling. And some people did comment about, you know, the guy will be the champ or the U.S. champ or something. Or he'll have a title. And then a couple of weeks later, he's like second match. And yeah, that, I don't know. I think that kills off the, the whole image of you being a top guy. But at the same time, I guess the way the promoters, you know, the guys in the WWE calling the shots are, are saying is, we're giving you a chance. If you don't produce, then then you don't produce and back down you go. So I I don't know. I mean, I've talked to Cody about it a lot, and he agrees that he's in no hurry to go there. You know, he's only 21, so he's got plenty of time. And uh, he, he would rather be seasoned and polished before he... He didn't make some move like that, you know, because he's got, you know, he's a big kid. He's 6'8", 260, and he he hasn't even filled out yet. You know, he's a whopper, and he's a he's a tough kid. You know, he was he wrestled amateur all through high school, and he was real good. And he's a uh, he's got unlimited potential, and he's a pretty boy too. He's got his mama's blonde hair and her blue eyes, so. He's a good-looking kid, and he's got a great future, and he's in no hurry. I think he's making all the right choices, you know. And and one of them is I'm telling him, you know, I'm warning him about, the, you know, there's a lot of negatives to that lifestyle on the road, too, and I'm trying to smart him up about those. You know, there's, you know, every town you go to, there's a party, and there's women, and there's, you know, there's lots of, you know, they seem fun at the time, but, you know, it can be a real precarious lifestyle as well. Definitely. The thing as well that always struck me that was quite interesting was when you came into the WWF, you were pretty much pushed into the main event angles straight away. And you mentioned that earlier on, you know, you were working with Ric Flair. When you came into the WWF, did Vince kind of tell you straight away, I'm going to push you to the moon straight away? Were you aware of that? 
Yeah, I mean, there's some left TV. When when I had a tryout match in election in Kentucky, they were doing a TV taping there, and they sent me out first. You know, it's called a dark match, an untelevised match. They sent me out first, and normally when Vince would bring a guy in who had already been in the wrestling business for a while, particularly guys with big names, and I didn't have a big name, but he would bring guys in who had been successful in other territories, and when he brought you in, Normally, he would send you out with a guy who was maybe a jobber, you know, a guy with lesser, you know, notoriety. And normally, have you lose to that guy. He would have you do a job just to check your attitude, you know, because a lot of guys would go, I'm not doing a job, you know, and he'd go, fine. Then he's not going to invest all his TV and all his time in you and then find out that you won't do business. You know, like if they give you a big push, they want to know that when it comes time for you to do what they want, you will. So I went out and they had me, they gave me a win, which was cool. And I'd already developed some cool moves. You know, I had what I call the sack of shit, you know, the fall away slam. I had the career ender where I belly back suplex guys off the top. I had the razor's edge. No one had ever seen any of that stuff before. So I was getting all the oohs and ahs that, that you, that they wanted. So when I came back, you know, Vince called me into his office there in the arena for a meeting. Now, lucky me, I got Kurt Hennig with me. I got Mr. Perfect there to go in, to walk in with me, so I'm not nervous at all. And I'll never forget Vince went well. At that time, you know, he was giving guys gimmicks that were, uh, like, the big boss man was really a corrections officer, so he was a big boss man. So he goes to me, well, I understand your father's an army officer. And I went, I knew what was coming, so I went, Vince, you know, you want me to be G.I. Joe, I'll be the best G.I. Joe I can be. And I said, did you ever see Scarface? He went, well, uh, no. And I said, say hello to the bad guy. And he started laughing, and I started doing all that Scarface stick to him, and he loved it, and he goes, well, we need a name. Now, I'd been thinking about names, because I know I'm going to meet with Vince. So I had a few names in mind. One of them was like Shrug Shadow. You know, I was going to use that. I remember Road Warrior Hawks, and you know, I'd be Deadbolt. And I went, eh, thanks, Hawk, but no, no thanks. So then I said, how about Razor, Vince? He went, uh, there's already, there's already that box of Razor Reddick. And I went, Vince, I kick his monkey fucking ass. Vince loved it, and Tito Santana gave me Ramon. You know, I said, Tito, man, I need a last name that starts with an R. He went, Ramon. So then I was raising them all, man, just like that. One TV, Lexington, Kentucky. I'll never forget it. And I guess one of your biggest moments in wrestling is WrestleMania 10, the ladder match with Sean, and I guess that's kind of your WrestleMania moment. You know, everyone's got a moment, and that's yours. What are your memories of working that ladder match with Sean, a guy that obviously you were good friends with? What was your experience like with that? Well, I mean, the funny part was, you know, Sean was the Intercontinental Champion. We're both villains, and we're both heels. We're traveling together every day. We're having a great time. And actually, one time, before the ladder match, one time we were wrestling in match. You know, we had a show coming up in Master Square Garden. Then the card came out, and it was, it was Razor Moe versus Shawn Michaels in the Garden. We're both villains. We're both heels. So we're going into the match. I mean, we know that mechanically we're going to have a good match. You know, we're both pretty skilled wrestlers. We know we're good entertainers. We know that we're going to have a good match, but we don't really know what the audience is going to think about it, you know? So on the way to the arena, you know, we're driving together. You know, I'm talking to Sean, and I go, well, what do you think, man? He goes, I don't know. He goes, he goes, we'll just see who they like, and we'll just go with it, you know? Because I really thought that going into it, because Sean was kind of a pretty boy, I really thought that the people would like Sean. It didn't work out that way in the garden. You know, Madison Square Garden's a tough town, you know, and they liked Razor. So, you know, I think Vince just did that. Vince always went to the shows in the garden. You know, even when non-televised events, Vince would be at the garden, and he would, and he would stand in front of the curtain in the aisleway and watch all the matches. So I think he did that to kind of see what was up between Sean and I, because this is before, you know, the angle with kid and all that. And so now, now, um, fast forward about a year, Sean and I are hanging out and they do a thing where 
you know, at that time, a lot of guys were taking pills. I was, Sean was. He's already admitted it. Sean's doing great now. He's clean and everything. I got some clean time now. You know, not as much as Sean, but, you know, I'm just starting this path. And uh, at that time, there was a lot of people being passed around. Somebody, I believe, Sean thinks so too, slipped him like a steroid, like a, a steroid tablet. Sean took it. So the next drug test that came out, he turned up positive for steroids. So, you know, he's at home in Texas. I'm in Florida. I call him like, hey, what time is your flight get in? Because we always met at the airport. We'd, we'd rent a car together. We'd share hotel rooms. You know, we would travel together. So I called him like, hey, what time is your flight get in? Mine gets in at like 2 p.m. He goes, I'm not going. I said, what? He goes, I failed the drug test. I said, no way. He goes, yeah. He goes, I'm not going, man. So I go, well, okay. So I go to the next town, and Sean stays home for like a month. And that I go to the next town, and then Vince calls the building wants to speak to me. And so he says, well, you know, I guess you heard about Sean. I said, yeah, I heard Vince. I want to tell you, it's ridiculous. I hang out with Sean every day. And uh, I said, Vince, Sean ain't taking steroids. I said, we don't even have time enough to go to the gym. You know, we were so busy traveling and doing interviews and doing appearances and blah, 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 blah. That, and we were lucky to hit the tanning bed and go to the gym for 30 minutes. You know, it was like we didn't have time. So anyway, shot that this time they have a battle royal. Me and Martel win. You know, the finalists. Martel puts me over. Now I'm the IC champ. But I've never beaten Sean. And the people know it, and I know it. So when I do interviews, and people go, we never beat Sean. I go, I know. I know I didn't beat Sean. So when he came back, he still had his belt. So now it was kind of cool because we both have belts and we're still wrestling each other in every town. Now now I'm kind of the good guy. I've already done the angle with Kid. And now I'm wrestling Sean, you know, in every town, but we both have belts. So then we show up in California one time. We have like a six-day tour in California. We go into the arena. We look at the lineup on the wall, and it says ladder match. And we're going, what? Ladder? You know, I didn't even, I've never even seen a ladder match. I'm going, what? And we're looking at the, you know, the guy from the office, Jack Lanza, Black Jack Lanza, who's like running the town for Vince. And we're going, what's this? Ah, you guys will figure it out. Just go out there. So we did, you know, and each night the match got a little bit better. And by the time we had three or four of them, the match was pretty sweet. We actually had better matches on that loop in California than we did that night at WrestleMania 10. Because sometimes the ladder just does cool stuff. Sometimes the ladder will bounce off the rope and just fall, like, right in your crotch or something. By accident. You know, sometimes it'll fall and hit the guy right in the face that you didn't plan. And it just was cool. We actually had better matches that weren't televised. But... You know, it worked out great. And to me, it was the only time that a ladder match really made sense because there was two belts, but there's only supposed to be one champion. So we both had belts. I never beat Sean. Sean never beat me. So we had to settle this. So I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to hang our belts from the ceiling of Madison Square Garden. There's going to be a ladder down the aisle. There's no ref, no rules, no time limit. Whoever gets both the belts wins. So it was really easy for people to understand, even if you don't like wrestling, you can go, well, I get it. Whoever gets the belt for the champ. Because, I mean, I know now they do this briefcase, money in the bank deal. To me, that's not the same as pulling the belts down, you know, and being the champ and stuff. But, yeah, it was, it was good times. There's nothing better than being in a ring with one of your best friends, you know, looking across the ring and there's your best buddy, you know, I mean. Those were those were great times, man. I mean, the thing is, we were so busy promoting WrestleMania that we didn't even hardly sleep the night before we got there. But all you have to do is walk out in front of those cameras and you know, in a roaring crowd, and boom, you're instantly you know revved up. But yeah, great times, man. Great times. Did you guys always know that the third guy was going to be Hulk? Because there's a lot of rumors that Sting was going to be the third guy or they tried to reach out to Bret Hart and different things. What did you guys know in the weeks leading up to the Bash at the Beach pay-per-view? Um, we had no idea who it was going to be. And and it was and the whole thing of who's the third guy is, 
that happened by accident. And and at first we did. I remember calling Brett. Kevin and I were on the road somewhere. We called Brett at home in Calgary. I spoke to him. Kev spoke to him. We told him that it was really fun working for WCW. You know, it was really laid back. It was guaranteed money. It was easy because we were so used to being in a shark tank in New York. And and coming to Atlanta was like being in a country club. It was just relaxed. I mean, we're used to a really cutthroat environment, and it was really... It was really tame in the locker room in Atlanta compared to New York. So we we relayed this information to Brett and said, hey, listen, you know, we know your contract's up. Bischoff really wants you. They're offering you a pretty sweet deal. You know, you got our support. You know, if you want to come down here, you know, you know, we got your back. Brett wasn't interested. You know, he, he stayed for a while till this big deal in Montreal went down, but he, um, so we didn't know. Actually, we were all, you know, we had hoped it would be Hogan, but Hulk had creative control in his contract, which meant he didn't have to do anything unless he wanted to. You know, we didn't have it in writing. He had it in writing. So there was, we actually went to the ring. We hadn't even met Hulk yet. I had met him briefly at that WrestleMania 9 in Las Vegas, and I didn't know him. And he wasn't a very popular guy with us then because we all were back in Brett. So I didn't know Hulk. You know, I was a big mark for him, but I didn't know him. And so we actually went to the ring that night in Daytona without even talking to Hulk because he wasn't even there yet. He was flying cross country on a private jet from Los Angeles where he'd been working on some movie. So we went to the ring hoping that it was going to be Hulk coming out. But Bischoff said, if Hulk doesn't come, then we're going to send Sting. And I know that, obviously, you've had your personal problems over the past kind of decade, but after you left Vince in 2002, did he ever contact you again about coming in for a show or an appearance at any point? No, I change my number pretty frequently, so I don't think Vince even has my number. And uh, I I wouldn't have gone. I mean... uh, I really went through some, you know, I ain't asking for anybody's sympathy, but, you know, I went through some really tough times. A lot of them were caused by my own behavior. I mean, I'm not, I'm not denying that. I made some bad choices. You know, I was abusing alcohol and I just was, you know, like, I, I don't know how to describe it, man. I just felt like, now what? Like, ever since I was a little kid, I wanted to be a big time pro wrestler. I did it. And then now what? Now what do I do? You know, like sit around and I got all this time on my hands with nothing to do. And it just, you know, it was just, I don't know, bro. I, yeah, I just made a lot of bad decisions. I got a lot of bad trouble. You know, I was just, I was spinning out of control, man. I didn't have any kind of purpose in my life anymore because my whole goal, like ever since I could remember, was I wanted to be in a wrestling business. I wanted to be a big star. And then, and then I thought, well, now then I'll work in the office and I'll help the young guys, and that's a natural progression, and that's where I'll end up. And uh, I, uh, I had a heart episode. I've been here in Atlanta for five weeks, so I guess six and a half, seven weeks ago, and today's March 28th. So seven weeks ago, I had um, this heart episode where I ended up in the hospital in intensive care in the cardiac unit in Florida for a week and I went in there like really sick and by the time I left I had completely recovered and even the doctor commented like you're a freak he said you're a genetic freak he said you're completely he said your heart is normal function now everything and uh while I was in the hospital a kid who served the food trays was a really big wrestling fan and he kept you know he was really wound up hey man hey I grew up watching hey man hey hey and Finally, I had to tell you, look, you know, I thank you very much, but, you know, I'm really beat up right now, bro. I'm just trying to wrestle. I mean, excuse me, I'm just trying to rest. and just trying to rest. And, um, you know, I had a sign on my door, no visitors, you know, no phone calls, nothing. I was just, the doctor wanted me just to lay there and rest. I had IVs in both arms and oxygen up my nose. And I was just kind of, you know, resting. And the kid kept coming back because I'm seeing this guy three times a day because he's bringing me food. And then one time he whipped out 
his iPhone, and on there he had the before and after pictures of Jake the Snake. You know, and Jake is here at the house. And um, I saw what a dramatic change that Jake had made, just in his physical appearance. And, and I've been talking to Jake, but I'd never seen the photo. So I knew good things were happening for him, and I knew that Dallas was kind of at the root of it. And I thought, well, am I going to rehab, like, again? Or maybe try something else, you know? I mean, and, you know, with... Like, I have positive stuff going on. Okay. And I have positive stuff going on. And, you know, like a purpose in life, you know, so instead of just treading water in a rehab. And I just feel like I've made the right choice. I'm not sure what happened. And, you know, I'm not really going to question it. I just feel so blessed to be moving in the right direction for the first time in a long time. I mean, I've got like 65 plus days now clean. And I've had longer times, but I've always been in, in like a facility, like a rehab or a jail or something. So now to be in the real world and be clean that long, and, and like I have no cravings, and I just feel great, bro. And well, just the last question we've got for you, Scott, is it's a two-part question from Daniel Bradley. Um, is there anyone that you never got to wrestle that you wish you had? And I guess the other part of that is, do you think there would ever be a situation where you would have – one more match, and is there anyone that you would like to do that with? Um, well, the one, uh, gosh, about the wrestlers, I, I would have liked to, but I never got to. Gosh, I don't know. Um, I got to wrestle so many great, talented guys that, gosh, that's hard. You know, I would have had to prepare for that to think about it. Um, right off the top of my head, I kind of got to say no. You know, I got to wrestle a lot of great talent along the way. I mean, there's a lot of young guys coming up now that that I wish, like, gosh, I wish I'd have crossed paths with him when I was at my peak and stuff like that. But I'm going to have to follow the doctor's advice on that. But, I mean, like, Hulk has a hip replacement. Ronnie Piper has a hip replacement. I guess they're keeping it a secret. But my doctor here in Atlanta told me that one of his friends did a, a hip did a hip resurfacing for Undertaker, and he's going to wrestle at WrestleMania here in a couple of weeks. So, you know, there's always that possibility. I would love to be, like, in a tag with my son Cody. Scott, fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on the show. We've loved every minute of it. Okay, my pleasure, man. I'll holler at you soon when I have some different news. Bye-bye.